Welcome who's, to everyone who's joined a few minutes early. We're just going to get ready uh, to start the webinar in just a few minutes. Thank you for joining. Good morning and good afternoon as people come in. We're just going to get started in about two minutes, so welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. We're just getting settled. Welcome to everyone who's joining. We'll get started in about two minutes. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a very full agenda and an exciting event. So welcome everyone. On behalf of the Hormonal IUD Access Group, the Research for Scalable Solutions Project, and the LEAP Initiative, welcome to this webinar on digital training approaches for family planning providers. I'm Kate Rademacher at FHI 360, and I'm going to hand right over to my colleague at USAID, Elaine Minotti, to start us off and provide a bit of opening. Thank you so much again for being here. Next slide. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Elaine Minotti from USC Washington's Office of Population and Reproductive Health, Service Delivery Improvement Division. And welcome on behalf of the Hormonal IUD Access Group, a global consortium of governments, donors, manufacturers, and implementing partners who are collaborating to expand access to the levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine device also referred to as a hormonal IUD, as part of our efforts to ensure comprehensive contraceptive method choice. As new and lesser used contraceptives, including the hormonal IUD, are introduced in more countries, innovative approaches to train existing and new family planning providers can help expand access and choice. Digital trainings, which are considered a part of our high impact practice for digital health, can improve provider knowledge and skills and may offer cost efficient and even more convenient opportunities to ensure providers are well 
well prepared to counsel and offer a range of family planning methods. These options can be important when in-person gatherings are restricted, such as during these last two plus years of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Oh, here we are, agenda. During this event, we look forward to hearing from Dr. Kayude Afolabe from Nigeria's Federal Ministry of Health about why this topic is important. We'll then hear from colleagues from FHI 360 and SFH Nigeria on an overview of recent research conducted in Nigeria that assessed a hybrid digital training approach. Then we'll have a rapid round robin to learn about several other online training resources for the hormonal IUD and have time for your questions. Time is very tight, so please use the dedicated Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as we go along and we'll try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A section. A recording of this event will also be made available to all who registered. Now I will hand over to Dr. Afolabe, who needs little introduction in this group as a family planning reproductive health champion, expanding method choice, and as an advocate, advocate for our FP workforce, not only for Nigeria, but worldwide. Thank you for joining us today. And Dr. Afolabe, over to you. Hopefully we have Dr. Afolabi still on the line. Are you there, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Elaine. Uh, I bring greetings from Nigeria to all stakeholders who are here at uh, this global dissemination. I'm Kayode Afolabi, just retired from the Federal Civil Service of Nigeria as Director and Head of Reproductive Health. And I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk on the needs for digital training and give a uh, data training solution, I give a brief overview on this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as, as a low middle income country, we are always very conscious of the fact that our resources are, are, are low and uh, even such resources are located for training are quite very scarce. So we have always considered our impact practice has been uh, very important for us to make the best use of uh, the mega resources we have. So digital training as imagine our impact uh, practice brings very big and expansive opportunity uh, <clears throat> for, for us to ensure training and retraining of our service provider. And uh, also it's important to consider the, the, the fact that we have a limited and poor internet coverage, uh, a serious bottleneck when we are considering digital training solution and looking at our own background as well as the local context. Therefore, we need to ensure an enabling environment and this we entail considering the overall ecosystem to make digital training appropriate to our own local needs and uh, all the intended users in country. So this, of course, we also need for us to ensure investment on hardware as well as software. And also bear in mind the need for maintenance of um, all these if we really must make the best use of digital training solution. Again, we are generally challenged on data issues, right from data uh, generation through transmission to analysis and use. So right from the beginning, we need to build into a digital training solution, key performance indicators, which will also enable us to uh, generate in-country evidence and uh, increase the global uh, body of knowledge. Next slide, please. Uh, as a country, our own justification for adopting digital training uh, include the fact that um, <clears throat> infrequent and very expensive training has actually characterized the routine training, the traditional training that we have been having. And of course, we know this could rub off negatively on quality of care. So there is the need for training and retraining of large pool of uh, service providers if we must preserve quality of care and expand access to services uh, on family planning and other sexual and reproductive health uh, uh, need. And also coupled with the fact that there are emerging evidence to support the fact that digital training 
especially if it's used in combination with um, other health enhancements like job aids, tools, and data, quite very cost effective. So our expectation uh, focus on um, system level outcome include the fact that um, we will have um, time and resource efficiency. And of course, this will enhance us to have better training and uh, improve the quality of care, like I just mentioned. And uh, when we look at the expected impact on, on our clients, overall, there have been improved access and uptake to quality family planning. And this will lead to reduced unintended pregnancies and all the other uh, sequelae of reducing unextended pregnancy, including reduction in maternal mortality on safe abortion, as well as uh, improved newborn and under five five survivor, all of which we lead to reduction in total fertility rate. This is how what we consider as our justification. And uh, when it comes to uh, the benefits, we, we know that um, efficiency in resource management, quality of care, continuity of care, as well as adherence to treatment protocols. We follow adoption of quality, I mean, uh, the digital training solution. And of course, it will also give us opportunity for continuous uh, learning uh, and teaching of our service providers. And of course, as a country, we have started to benefit from this um, uh, listed uh, expected benefits. And um, we have also started to generate evidence. Strong learning, in fact, have been uh, generated to contribute to body of knowledge globally by our adoption of digital training on Mona IUD in Nigeria. And all this will be presented today. So I thank you very much for your attention. Over. Thank you so much, sir. That really helps set the stage and gives us good inspiration for the rest of the event. Thank you so much. So now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Helena Nyasi, uh, to kick us off uh, and share some recent research in Nigeria, which Dr. Afalabi mentioned. Helen, over to you. Thank you, Kate. And thank you so much, Dr. Afalabi, for your opening remarks. And good day, everyone. I'm Helen Nyasi. I'm Senior Technical Officer at FHI 360 Nigeria Country Office. I'm part of the study team on the mixed methods evaluation of the digital hybrid training course on hormonal IOD. This is a course for family planning providers in Nigeria. I'll be co-presenting with my colleague from SFH, Dr. Eze Wokoma, who you'll be hearing from shortly. I'll present the project overview and the methodology, and Dr. Eze will present the results of this study. This study was co-funded by USAID through the Research for Scalable Solutions R4S project, and by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through the LEAP initiative. Next slide. In 2021, the Federal Ministry of Health adopted a national plan to introduce and scale up the hormonal IUD to expand method choice in Nigeria. Typically, family planning providers in Nigeria, are these family planning provider trainings in Nigeria are designed to be in two steps. There's the classroom-based learning with practice on pelvic models followed by supervised practicum with actual clients. Trainees are then certified after sufficiently passing the set standards. For family planning providers who have experience providing a long acting method, such as a copper IUD and or implants, adding hormonal IUD means at least one to two days classroom instructions and two to three days of clinical practice. In the changing landscape of, of our world, alternative training approaches are being explored, including when we have travel restrictions like we have with COVID-19 or other gathering restrictions. Donors and implementers are seeking more cost-effective training approaches. These alternative approaches are being tried and tested as we have done in this study. 
We can then gather these lessons and apply them to this and other family planning method introduction. Next slide. Um, digital health to support family planning providers have been identified as an enhancement to the high impact practices in family planning, which we all know as HIPS. Most described um, digital training approaches use digital technologies to deliver provider post-training refreshers. Our goal here was to add to the body of knowledge that positions digital training as a component of the initial, that's the preliminary training for providers. Next slide. Our rationale for this study was to explore cost-efficient training options as part of support uh, for the scale-up of the hormonal IUD and to contribute to expanding method choice in Nigeria, even when, like I mentioned earlier, in-person gatherings are restricted. We also aim to evaluate hybrid digital training feasibility, acceptability, impact on knowledge and costs. Next slide. The project design and implementation team comprised of colleagues from SFH, PSI, FHI 360 and the Federal Ministry of Health Nigeria. As mentioned, we evaluated the feasibility and acceptability of this intervention in which the didactic component of the hormonal IUD training was done electronically using a digital training course. The digital training course was hosted on the Kaya platform, which is operated by the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. We'll share a link to that course in just a minute. In the study, 60 family planning providers from three states, Oyo, Enugu, and Kanu, who have experience in providing copper IUDs were selected to receive the digital didactic training, followed by an in-person practicum that, map, that mirrors the same used to certify hormonal IUD providers. Also note that the digital didactic training and the clinical practicum content are equivalent to what you would normally cover in a three-day in-person training. You can see primary study measures here, and I'll speak about this more in a moment. Next slide. Okay, here I'll walk you through the training approach. The training is in three stages. The two week digital didactic training is the first stage. Um, the second stage is the one day in-person uh, workshop where trainees in groups of 10, they do role play and practice on pelvic models. The third stage of the training involves the provision of service to actual clients under the instruction of a clinical supervisor, and this is done within a six-week period. Now, the study components you see in orange are the components you see in orange are study components. They're not part of the um, full training. Then the components in pink are the training components, which we hope can potentially be scaled up. The study components in stage one are the pre and post training evaluation, as well as an exit survey to gauge the user experience. The study component in stage two is the trainee evaluation done by master trainers to assess their competency in counseling, insertion, and the removal skills using the OSCE checklist. At the end of stage three of the training, both the providers and the supervisors were interviewed to gauge their overall experience of the process. At every stage, costing and process data were collected for analysis. Next slide. Okay, as I've already alluded to in previous slides, we use the mix of methods to measure. We measure knowledge through the pre and post training evaluations. We measured competency in counseling, insertion, and removal using the OSCE checklist. We measured satisfaction and overall user experience from clinical trainers, providers, and subnational health teams through the exit surveys and interviews. Finally, we looked at the costs associated with training, practicum, and practice on live clients. Next slide. So now I'll hand off to my colleague from SFH, Dr. Eze Wokoma, to present the exciting results of our study. Over to you, Dr. Eze. 
Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Helen, for that um, intro. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Eze Wokoma. I work at Society for Family Health in Nigeria. Um, I'm the program coordinator in the reproductive health and family planning units, and I was also the program coordinator for this R4S LIP study. Next slide, please. So um, just like um, Helen has said earlier on, uh, we recruited providers from three states and both public and private um, health sectors. Um, about 40% of these providers were from Enugu, 35% were from Oyo, and uh, about 23% from Kano. Uh, approximately about 60% of these providers were from the public sector and about an additional 15% reported to work in both uh, the public and private sector. Um, provider age was about 48 years and um, a quarter of the providers have had had uh, uh, previous family planning trading on digital um, components and on nearly half of these providers um, were nurses, more than one third were about midwives. Next slide, please. So um, on the pre and post knowledge um, assessments, um, before starting the digital training and after completing the digital training, that's uh, before, um, before the particum, providers took uh, a knowledge assessments um, the pre and post test um, trainings, um, the assessments were basically um, some sets of 44 multiple choice questions, um, which either came as a select one option or select multiple or two or false. Um, the scores um, were calculated on the CAIA platform, and uh, uh, the, the results showed that there was uh, increased um, 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 scoring between um, the pre and post test was substantially increased. The average knowledge score was uh, between uh, was uh, about uh, increased by 24 points um, across uh, the pre and post test. Next slide, please. So uh, we also had to um, 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 conduct an objective structured clinical examination. Um, after the digital training on the Kaya platform, um, practicum was with mannequin was done, um, which was followed by an OSCE um, to assess uh, the skills gained. And um, three stations were used for this OSCE. Um, they were the counseling station the insertion and the removal station. So the counseling station had a um, provider um, with a standardized patient who had um, um, a role that was already um, um, real out to be used for each of the uh, trainees. Of course, we also had um, the other um, um, counseling materials. We showed we had all um, complements of uh, family planning methods um, in the context of volunteerism and the informed choice. And of course, um, the other um, counseling kits. So all trainees were assessed um, by a study supervisor who had been trained um, earlier using a, a checklist that was uploaded on the survey CTO. What well, this was basically to ensure um, real-time upload and assessments. And then the development of this checklist was uh, took into consideration existing hormonal IUD materials and they aligned to in-country guidelines for lack service delivery. Um, the checklist was jointly developed by SFH, PSI, and FHI 360. Um, each contributed uh, immensely to the uh, development and it underwent series of uh, quality assessment from the quality teams and of course validated twice by the Federal Ministry of Health to ensure it was uh, conforming to the guidelines. Next slide, please. So from what we can see here, um, the, the performance was very high for the um, all the stations in the OSCE and um, where this was um, due to the fact that these were lab trained providers already competent and providing services to copper IUD. Um, again, no time was allotted for each of the stations and uh, more, most of the, the providers had already just finished uh, having a, a hormonal IUD particular modules. So we understand that this could have been a reason for the high scores. Also, um, we noticed there were some failed steps. This was basically um, most of the providers that failed, failed one or two critical steps um, along the way. Um, the average score in the counseling session and the session was about 95, while that of the removal was about 94. But from what we see in the results, we see that uh, there was a wider variation, more variation in the scores in the counseling um, compared to the session and removal. So this therefore provided an area of concentration for us while we were reviewing this training package uh, for the scale up. Next slide, please. So from the, um, from the exit interviews we had on the Kaya platform, we understood that there was high user satisfaction with digital training. Um, results from the exit interview revealed that um, about 85% of the providers that took the course felt that digital training was more convenient than an in-person training. 
um, like 100% agreed that they felt very prepared for the practicum after taking the digital training course. And about 85% indicated they would uh, recommend their digital training uh, to other providers. Next slide, please. So when we look at the provider preference, that's the online versus in-person, 70% of the providers agree strongly that they got the same understanding from digital training as they would have gotten also from uh, in-person training. So about 60% 60, 60 of the providers felt that there, there was sufficient opportunity to ask questions, uh, just like about 67% um, did not report any navigation issue. But this also brought to us an opportunity for improvements, because if you look at what we have there, 40% felt that they had many unanswered questions. So we had to put this into consideration while we were reviewing the training package um, for the, um, for the um, scale up. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the user experience and technical challenges, um, almost everyone reported um, using um, a smartphone for the training, about 96% of the providers. And then the most, most providers completed this training at home after work hours, and almost everyone reported um, having one technical challenge or the other. So the idea of um, most of the providers having this training done at home and after work hours was actually a good one for us, seeing that that was the idea of uh, bringing up this uh, digital training to uh, ensure that work hours are not lost when providers go for trainings. So these challenges um, we noticed from the providers that we can see some um, connection problems, login issues, issues with bandwidth. We found out that most of these problems and complaints came from providers in Enugu states and older providers, and also, of course, providers who had not participated in any form of digital training before. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, this, um, this is a comment from one of the providers, um, um, a feedback from one of the providers in Enugu, I'm saying that the e-learning training is not comfortable for us because of our working condition and leaving our families to go places to stay two or three days coming back. Instead, you're at home doing everything at your leisure. Even after that, um, when you finish your work, you go to the e-learning, you can continue to late to do your work. So I prefer the e-learning to that classroom work. So that's um, a feedback from a provider in Enugu. Next slide, please. So part of what we did when we, uh, when we had this um, study was to also um, uh, conduct a qualitative interview with some of the stakeholders, both uh, the trainers, um, the trainees, and also um, key informants from the Federal Ministry of Health. So part of the recommendation, recommendation given um, to improve um, the training model was um, access to better network and data allowance. Um, that we're looking at having larger data allowance and fewer network issues to improve training. Um, increasing the stipend, the data stipend to ensure um, the internet costs are taken care of. Then for the practical improvements, um, there was this um, recommendation to have a um, um, provision of commodities ahead of time to ensure that the practicum was uh, conducted at the right time, increase the number of days for the practicum instead of having one day, have more days so that the confidence of the providers will be built around going for actual clients and then schedule actual clients um, practicum immediately after the practicum. Then for the incentives, um, um, most of the reports and feedback um, supported certificates being given um, to um, boost the morale of providers and then to have digital training orientation ahead of e-training um, because we understand that uh, most of the providers that complain about this uh, navigation issues, bandwidth issues, and the recommendation is to have um, an e-learning or e-training um, orientation before time. And also to help with uh, the clinical supervision, there will be need to expand the pool of clinical supervisors. Next slide, please. So, so this, is a, this is a feedback from the key informant in the Federal Ministry of Health. Um, so we can as well um, start to prepare for scale up because we're really excited about the digital training from the government perspective and as a policymaker too, I am keenly interested in it. It will allow me a very rapid traction and invariably will also support access to family planning information services as an enhancing optics. So, I mean, as well as enhancing optics. So this, this was a feedback from the key informant in FMOH um, fully showing satisfaction um, for, the, for the results coming out from the study. Next slide, please. So uh, part of what we did was to also conduct a retrospective uh, activity-based costing exercise um, to determine the costs um, the provider train for the digital hormonal IOD training. Um, this included the digital didactic training, um, the in-person practicum, and the competency supervision with actual clients. So all costs were based on actual expenditure for the training period. 
So if we can see, as you can see here, across all states, the hybrid training approach cost about 316 US dollars per provider trained. We compared this to an earlier assessment, uh, which found out that the cost of traditional hormonal IV training, well, which was entirely in person, cost about $426 per provider trained. So this um, indicates that the, the hybrid digital approach led to cost savings. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we can say that this study um, found a, a hybrid digital training approach to the hormonal IOD to be highly acceptable. It produced high knowledge gains and skill levels and resulted in potential cost savings relative to traditional in-person training alternatives. Next slide. So what, what we're doing for the next steps, um, following the results of this study, the Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria has already decided to incorporate the digital training approach as part of the national scale up for hormonal IOD training in Nigeria. So we're encouraging the process of uh, disseminating results at the state level, and also working with other partners in countries such as Chai, Jepaigo, and MSI to incorporate this digital training and tool into their provider trainings. You, you, you can actually assess uh, this hormonal IOD digital training module on the Kaya platform at the link on the slide. Well, of course, we'll also be putting this on the chat box for everyone. So in addition to this, um, we are also in the process of making some minor modifications um, uh, and the digital training modules will be made available for the global good that can be used or adapted for other contexts. We're also in the process of um, translating these training modules into French. Uh, we will share this with uh, everyone that has registered with this webinar uh, when they are ready. Next slide, please. So this, this is one of the pictures from the um, our validation meetings. Just like we stated before, the Federal Ministry of Health through the RH Division of the Family Health Departments, Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria was so supportive from the beginning. And we incorporated them from the planning up to the whole process of implementation. And this was just one of those validation meetings we had um, to review the documents and the training materials. Next slide, please. So you can see members of the study team listed on the slide. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to taking your questions during the Q&A portions, I will hand over now to Kate. Kate, take it away. Thank, Thank you so much, much Eze and, and Helen. Really appreciate the presentation and uh, so excited to be sharing this, the results of the study with the global community. For those of you, we've gotten a few questions in the Q&A chat. Please go ahead and submit additional Q&A in the dedicated Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, the team is reviewing those now and we're going to have a time where we'll take some, we'll respond in, um, in writing to some and verbally in a few minutes. But before that, um, if we can move to the next slide, we're going to have a quick round robin with several colleagues um, additional colleagues to provide a brief overview of some other uh, online and digital training resources for the hormonal IUD. Uh, I, we put in the chat the link to the Kaya platform, which um, Dr. Eze and Dr. Helen referenced. And now I'm going to hand, um, hand over to Kate Derringer from USAID um, to provide us with a brief overview of the training resource package for family planning. And then again, we'll do a quick round robin with several other colleagues. Kate, can I hand it to you? Thanks. Thank you so very much. Greetings, everyone. My name is Kate Derringer, and I'm a senior clinical family planning advisor in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID. And I'm very pleased to present a brief update on the family planning training resource package, which is a global good in clinical professional development, and to share an update on what the TRP steering committee has been doing recently to revitalize the platform. Next slide, please. The TRP was launched in 2012 by USAID, WHO, and UNFPA in order to meet the need for a standardized package of clinical FPRH content, curricula, and materials. And the library continues to be designed and adapted from the global evidence base and in collaboration with experts representing multiple agencies and organizations, many of whom are present today. The TRP incorporates competency-based approaches and adult learning principles designed for adaptation to practice context and is intended for a range of cotters and in both pre or in-service clinical education. The current library offers 15 method specific and four cross-cutting modules, one of which you'll hear about shortly. Next slide, please. Uh, and from 2020 to 2022, the TRP steering committee has been in the process of engineering a wide scale platform enhancement led by Momentum Country and Global Leadership and informed by an extensive stakeholder engagement and data collection process 
which was designed to understand perspectives on the platform's accessibility, connectivity, and functionality. The findings from that endeavor have been translated into what you will now see as new accessibility features and will include personalization, a peer community exchange forum, embedded method specific videos from the Global Health Media Project, streamlined navigation, and offline utilization capabilities. So I welcome everyone attending this session today to support the launch and dissemination of the new platform planned in the coming months. And we look forward to expanding the availability of the TRP with the help of partners, WHO collaborating centers, UNFP country offices, and at ICFP 2022. So if you haven't already, please do join the TRP global community. And I'll now turn it over to my colleague who will share the TRP's newest module featuring the hormonal IUD. Dr. Ratnagar, over to you. Thank you, Kate. Um, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Neeta Bhatnagar, the Senior Technical Advisor, Family Planning with the Momentum Country and Global Leadership, JAPAIGO. What you see on the screen is the landing or the homepage of the newly redesigned training resource package that Kate Dieringer just mentioned. As you can see, it has the features nicely marked for the facilitator to easily select the module he or she wants to conduct the training and navigate uh, the contents of the module. Uh, when you click on the training module, which is right on, on the top right side, when you click on the training modules, you get a menu of the categories of the training methods. And uh, today we would focus on the hormonal IUD uh, module. Uh, so when you click on that, you can click on the long acting reversible contraceptives and then on the hormonal IUD. Next slide, please. When you click on the hormonal IUD, this is what uh, you will see. This is the home page for the hormonal IUD. And this is, this is similar. If you click for any other module, you get the home page of that particular um, module. You can, what you will see here is an overview of the module and how to prepare a session for facilitating this module. The overview includes the purpose of, uh, of this uh, module, a facilitator's uh, guide, uh, which also includes case studies, how to use case studies and how to conduct a role plays. Now, when you want to start preparing for a session, you can see the blue box which says start preparing for a session and there is a little arrow. When you click on this, next slide please, you will come to the contents of the module. On the left side, you will see that the contents, the contents are actually um, similar for all the modules. Uh, so the contents consist of the session plan uh, which that describes the session content, the methodology of the instructions, the learning activities, resources and materials to assist the facilitator. And it also contains the uh, training schedule or the training agenda. It has the presentation slides. It's all prepared, it's ready-made. The presentation slides with videos embedded. The presentation slides are basic, advanced and optional, depending on the quarter of your audience. The optional slides actually are the slides which, uh, which deal with the insertion and removal of the, uh, of the hormonal IUD using both the techniques, using the one-handed inserter and the two-handed inserter. So depending on whatever the facilitator wants or depending on the quarter, you use those presentation slides. Then you have the evaluation tools, uh, which is basically the checklist, the skill assessment checklist, the pre and the post um, tests or the assessments and the course evaluation. You have a set of handouts. They are actually about 16 to 18 handouts and depending and these handouts are referred to throughout the session plan and the presentation slides. And then you have a section on the references and a discussion section. This is, a, this is something new that is here in, this, um, in the new TRP, uh, a newly designed TRP, is that you have an opportunity to discuss 
with your peers and your colleagues, your experiences on using this module of the, or if there were any challenges or um, how you uh, addressed those challenges. And what more, uh, we also have this translated in French now. So depending on whatever the, the, you, the facilitator can actually view these, um, uh, these, the various contents, can download, can save, and adapt. There is an adaptation checklist which helps the facilitator to adapt these uh, the content to the country context. So it's very, very simple now. It's very easily navigable and it makes the journey of the facilitator very smooth. Now, before going to the next slide, next slide, please. Uh, I would really, as Kate said, um, welcome you all to uh, make this uh, globally available and disseminated widely for the benefit of the continuous develop, professional development of our um, service providers. Thank you so much. One more thing, sorry, is that the, the site, the new site, the URL is not currently available. It's still undergoing some backend um, uh, clearing up of backend bugs. As soon as it is available, we would be sharing it with you. Thank you so much. And I would uh, hand it over to Kai uh, from there. Kai, over to you. Thank you, Nita. Well, um, good morning, um, good afternoon, um, and even good evening to the colleagues in Asia. Uh, I'm Kai Risse, working at Bayer and based in Berlin. Uh, I'm working in the sustainability department and responsible for our long acting reversal contraceptives, that means Jadel, our implant, and also Mirena. And I'm very pleased uh, to provide you a brief overview today of the digital materials that we are providing to support introduction and training activities in the hormonal, for the hormonal IUD, and particularly for Mirena uh, with the one handed EVO inserter, because as a manufacturer, we are only allowed to provide information about our own product. And just for your information, all materials that are shown during this webinar today are available at the Mono IUD uh, access platform. Next slide, please. So the first item uh, that has been developed is a training slide deck, um, which is intended to provide a basis for effective training on Mirena and covering important topics such as clinical data, treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding, um, also medical eligibility criteria, and also important safety information. Counseling is in one chapter, the placement, uh, post-placement procedure, the removal procedure as well, and also frequently asked questions are covered in this training slide deck. And this training slide deck provides a general overview of the different uh, topics and is not intended to, to be an exhaustive resource on each topic. So next slide, please. We are also offering access and licenses to a virtual training module. And um, this virtual training module has been developed during the pandemic as no face-to-face -face trainings were possible, but there was still the demand in the markets and there was still a high need for trainings. And therefore uh, this training module was developed. And now I would like to give you a brief overview of the tool looks like and also what advantages this virtual training module offers. The next slide, please. So the module itself is set up in two sections. So the first section um, is um, a set of training slides. And these are the same training slides that are just shown before and that are available on the um, IOD platform. And it's optional to go through these slides and before you do the training itself. Uh, so it can be like a refresher and it can be like also to set like the start of a classroom training. And we think it's really useful to have the basic information first at the beginning of the training and then proceed with the training of the insertion procedure afterwards. So next slide, please. And this is the view how the screen looks like, the tool looks like. And uh, the user, the trainee can set different options during the training. We can choose different perspectives. Um, an interior view is also possible as you can see here. Uh, just to really, really closely follow each step. And this is quite unique um, as no pelvic simulator like the Zoe model offers this possibility. And also the clinical setting, the procedure is always done blindly. And uh, so in the virtual training, the trainee has the opportunity to see exactly the consequences of each step. Next step, next slide, please. 
It is possible also um, to do a guided training. That means where all steps are given in the correct order, like a guide is guiding you through the different steps. And also an unguided training um, where the trainee must perform all steps alone with a gui without guidance. Next slide. As said, uh, different perspectives can be selected, uh, really to observe the procedure from different angles. And the options are oblique, lateral, and also the top view, as you can see on the slide. It is also possible to switch to the interior view and uh, really to exactly follow what is happening during the procedure. Next slide. Also, um, what has been covered is uh, different placement options for the retroverted and introverted uterine are also uh, optional to choose, really to train the different techniques that are applied, need to be applied for the different uterine. Next slide. This is now really an example why really the different perspectives increase understanding of the key steps. And here it is an example of a lateral and interior view. And this is really great to demonstrate the importance of having a straightened pathway to have the best ch chance of placing the IOD at the fundus to increase the comfort and reducing the risk of perforation. And this also demonstrates why applying and maintaining traction with a geniculum is so important. And especially as I guess that no one really likes the use of a geniculum. So next slide, please. So at the end of the process, you receive an objective feedback on how the various steps were performed, um, which steps should be practiced again. And really the beauty of uh, a digital training tool is that you can repeat it as often as you like until you have memorized each step and all skills are mastered. And as I said, we are providing licenses to this tool and you will find further information, including the request form at the Hormonal IOD access portal. And with this, I'm handing over to my colleague, Jill from MedSense360. Great, thank you, Kai. Um, hi, I'm Jill Kiesberg. I'm the Senior Director of Global Access at MedSense360. We're a nonprofit pharmaceutical organization, and our mission is to catalyze equitable access to medicines and devices through product development, policy advocacy, and collaboration with global and US partners. Globally, we do this work through our wholly owned subsidiary, Impact RH360. Next. Just to begin with, I'd like to provide a quick overview of our product, Avibella. Avibella is a hormonal IUD indicated for the prevention of pregnancy and treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding. The duration of use is up to six years, depending on local regulatory approvals. The shelf life is 60 months or five years. And Avibella is available in both a two-handed inserter, which is similar to the copper IUD, and a single-handed inserter. And today I'm gonna to focus on the training resources that are available for the two-handed inserter. Next. Avibella is a relatively new product on the global market. It was approved by the US FDA under the brand name Lyletta in 2015. And since then, our global regulatory footprint has been expanding. Has been expanding quickly. Um, it was first registered in Madagascar in 2018 and is now registered in the six countries you see here on this map. We have three other submissions that are currently pending. And by 2025, we plan to submit for registration in a total of 25 countries. To enable broad access to the product, we offer Avibella at a subsidized price of 950 per unit. And that's for all the units ordered through the global procurement catalogs on behalf of public sector programs in the access group's priority countries and not just the ones where we're registered. Next. To support the introduction of Avi Bella, we developed two training resources, an insertion and removal training deck and an insertion training video. These resources are available in English, French, and Spanish. We also provide a master trainer to support our partners to roll out cascaded training on the method. 
We're very pleased that all versions of these resources are available online and are easily accessible on the Hormonal IUD Access Group's website, as you can see here. Next. Here you see the contents of the training deck. It contains a comprehensive overview of the insertion and removal process, and it's intended for use with trained healthcare providers. It can be used as a method specific training just on Avibella or integrated into a larger, more comprehensive family planning training effort. Next. To supplement the slide deck, we also offer a video that details the insertion procedure. And here you see some stills from that video. Next. While these materials were originally designed for in-person trainings, the COVID-19 pandemic, like many of us, helped us think creatively about how to conduct Avi Bella trainings virtually. In June 2021, we partnered with Marie Stopes in Kenya to deliver this training online. The screenshots that you see here are from this training, and it was conducted by one of our master trainers, Dr. Mitch Krennan. Using just two cameras, Dr. Crennan was able to present the Avi Bella insertion and removal deck in video, as well as demonstrate the insertion process and supervise the insertion practice of providers. A total of eight providers from Marie Stopes Kenya attended, and these then went on to provide cascaded trainings for others. This helped us demonstrate that with just a few key adjustments, as we've heard a lot about today, it's possible to conduct effective, engaging product training in a virtual context. So thank you for giving me next, please. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to introduce Avi Bella's training resources, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you so much. Jill, and thank you so much to all the colleagues who participated in that uh, round robin. That was really a great resource uh, overview. And will you be seeing the chat, uh, excuse me, seeing links in the chat? And again, all of the resources that you heard about today are available at the Hormonal IED Access Portal uh, in the resource library. So we just have a few minutes for Q&A. We're going to just take a couple of uh, questions that have come in. For those of you who have questions, a reminder to please insert them in the dedicated Q&A box at the bottom. Um, we also have a special words of reflection that we're going to move into in just a few moments. So if you haven't had a chance to put your question in the, in the chat box, please do so. We're also, since we won't have enough time to go through all of them today, we will prepare a written document uh, and circulate it to the people who have registered, as well as the recording from this event following the webinar. So first I'm gonna ask uh, my colleague from Nigeria, Dr. Eze, to answer a question about the study that was described by you and, you and Dr. Helen. Um, one of the respondents asked whether there was an opportunity for providers who participated to ask questions of one another to share lessons learned and challenges. Can you take that, Eze? Thank you so much, um, Gates and our other panelists. So yes, um, to answer your question on uh, that, uh, we actually had um, about three levels of uh, uh, um, avenue where providers could actually discuss and share concerns and challenges with the training. So on the Kaya platform, we have a session called the Get Help Session, where which was more like a chat room. Providers could just jump in there, drop in questions. Um, and uh, these questions were not about, mostly about the navigation issues or challenges about taking some of those courses. So yes, that Get Help Session is on Kaya and easily approachable for providers to ask questions and get real-time answer from us. And that area of um, support was through the WhatsApp platform. We created a WhatsApp platform and um, groups for the various uh, states where questions were also asked and then what dedicated staff who was able to answer those questions and help them get along with the course. And one more thing they did again was we had these Zoom sessions. We had Zoom calls every week for the two weeks they had to do training and that Zoom basically to have that discussion with providers and then get their issues and just challenge them. So what this thing did in general was it helped to encourage this social media community of parties providers, and then we found that that was a way to encourage those that uh, were somehow lagging behind to um, speeding up and finish up. Uh, that support was given and uh, we intend to continue that way. 
Thank you so much, Eze. Um, Helen, there was a question, if I can turn to you next, Dr. Helen, there are a couple questions that I thought maybe you could answer. One was um, there, you know, obviously this evaluation focused on the hormonal IED. There's a question, a couple of questions about whether this could be applied to other contraceptive methods. So maybe you could take that. And also there was a question about low tech options. And uh, so perhaps you can discuss what, the, what uh, participants did if there were bandwidth issues for connectivity. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kate. So um, very quickly, uh, just to reiterate the goal for this uh, particular study, we wanted to add to the body of knowledge that positions um, digital training as a component for initial training for providers. So even though this particular study focused on hormonal IUD, we hope that these lessons and the results that we have shared now, you know, can be transferable to other method introduction or other training efforts that um, uh, other methods uh, introductions uh, are looking at. So uh, for the second question, on the Kaya platform, there were options for downloading the material so that you can use them offline. So that option was there for people who had bandwidth issues. So that's one low tech way that we were able to solve bandwidth problems. Over Kate. Thank you so much, Helen. And we're just gonna have time for one more question. Um, Kai from Bayer, there was a question about the simulation tool that you showed, what the traction scale is. Can you just answer that very briefly? Very briefly, all right. Um, yeah, it's kind of a simulation. Um, well, you need to apply track, uh, traction um, to the cervix uh, to stabilize and align with the cervical um, canal. Um, um, and therefore it's, it really, with the mouse, uh, you can uh, put the traction, uh, you can simulate the traction that you need to apply um, to the cervix. And then you just click the button to maintain the traction. And this is really to remind um, the healthcare professional, uh, even if you don't see a lot, a lot of have, is happening and a lot of need is needed to really have the alignment between the uh, cervix and the canal. Um, and it's, it's a simulator. I, th I think it's the best really to try it out, to practice it and to see um, how great it is. And uh, yeah, I really can really encourage you to just to test it. Yeah, thanks. And on that reminder, we, um... Bayer has graciously extended uh, free licenses uh, by request. There's a very short application uh, for use in LMIC settings. And so um, I'll repaste the chat there. If you want to request one of those licenses, you can fill out the form. Um, so now again, apologies for being short on time, but we have a lot of great questions coming in from the Q&A chat. So we're gonna respond to those in writing. You can look at the bar if you wanna see the answers that have come in so far, we'll provide written Q&A afterwards. But I'm now gonna hand it over to Dr. Saad, who's going to share a few words of reflection for us. Uh, Dr. Saad, can I hand it to you? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you to the organizers, um, particularly the Hormonal IUD Access Group for this opportunity and uh, also to the presenters for this wonderful session. My name is Dr. Saad Abdul Mumin. I work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Family Planning Team in the headquarters here in the US. Um, I had the opportunity in my previous uh, role at USAID to provide technical leadership in the introduction of hormonal IUD in some countries in Africa. And Nigeria was one of these countries that we work closely with the Federal Ministry of Health under the leadership of Dr. Apolabi uh, to introduce a hormonal IUD. With my experience in several countries uh, introducing methods, I, I, I think I would say that uh, Nigeria was really an exemplar and Nigeria has really set the pace and the bar high for the introduction of hormonal IUD and other methods, particularly building on the experience of Nigeria in the introduction of DMPASC, still under the uh, leadership of uh, Dr. Kayode Apolabi. And uh, uh, he is a visionary leader that really um, uh, sees how uh, any effort or intervention in the country aligns with the national um, strategic Health Development Plan or the National Roadmap for Family Planning in Nigeria. And um, Nigeria also committed to scaling and coordinating the introduction of new and underutilized contraceptive technologies in its uh, FP2030 commitment, still under the leadership of Dr. Kayode Apolabi. And Dr. Apolabi's incredible leadership was really instrumental to achieving all these successes in, in, in moving the country forward uh, in introducing uh, methods to expand method choice, including the introduction and scaling of hormonal IUD in the country. 
He has the vision and determination to make a difference in the national family planning ecosystem. And he, was a, he is a leader that really sees success as collective accomplishment uh, based on team building. Um, he continued to lead the introduction and scale up of the hormonal IUD in spite of the pandemic because the effort started much earlier in the country, but the, the pandemic did not really derail the um, introduction and scaling process through what Dr. Abolabi called a dream team that really met regularly to discuss the introduction plan and through the coordination and leadership of the uh, product introduction coordination mechanism uh, of the National Reproductive Implementation uh, uh, Committee. And this was a phased approach uh, for Nigeria to really set the pace and have success in the introduction process. In all the work, I think given the challenges, um, that reminds me of the quote that victory and success uh, belong to the tenacious and Dr. Akolabi's tenacity, technical and managerial leadership are above and beyond. And uh, borrowing from our Latin colleagues that uh, his leadership is what we term noli secundus. Um, it also reminds me that uh, Afolabi, uh, a quote from MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., that a, a genuine leader is not a stature for consensus, but a molder of consensus. This really truly describes uh, Dr. Apolabi's leadership and point to not just the powerful traits of persuasiveness and communication skills that a leader uh, must have, but also to the importance of teamwork and compromise. With this, I am truly humbled and uh, with this opportunity and honored to know and work with um, Dr. Afolabi and uh, in different uh, um, interventions in the country, but uh, particularly the demonstrable uh, success of the introduction of uh, hormonal IUD in Nigeria. With this, uh, on behalf of the uh, hormonal IUD access group, we will present you with this certificate of appreciation and uh, we thank you so much for your outstanding leadership. And uh, yeah, and uh, happy birthday again. Dr. Apolabi's birthday was uh, May 31st. With this, back to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Saad. And maybe we can come off a of video and give uh, Dr. Apolabi a, a virtual applause as he uh, begins his retirement and celebrates his birthday. And Dr. Apolabi, I don't know if you wanna end us with a few remarks um, just as we close this event. Oh, I think you're on mute, sir. Yes, thank you very much, Kate. And I thank uh, Dr. Abdulmumin Saad for those kind words. I really appreciate all my colleagues and stakeholders here, uh, particularly for considering it um, uh, strong enough for me to be recognized in this way. I, I'm really impressed and I'm further encouraged to do my best even greater than what I've done at the Federal Ministry of Health as a global champion and um, a committed stakeholder on sexual and reproductive health. Thank you very much. Over to Kate. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. And I'm glad we were able to do this virtually, even if we can't all be together, but this has been a wonderful discussion. If we can move to the next slide. Um, just to thank you all for joining. And again, we shared a lot of resources in the chat, just to remind you that if you go to www.hormonaliud.org, you can go to the resource library and follow, find uh, links to all of the excellent resources. We are still responding to the Q&A. As I mentioned, we'll share the recording of this event as well as the written Q&A with everyone who registered. Thank you again for this learning exchange, for this opportunity to be together. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and week. Take care, thanks again. <laughs>